Hello friends and family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for Saturday, October 3rd. We are talking about the dog duty ascetic, the kukura vataka. And his behavior has to sit on a spectrum. Um, within Buddhist philosophy, but also, I think, if a reasonable person thinks about it, there are really only two ends, two ultimate extremes, uh, where a person can end up. On one end, we have the idea of hedonism, total self-indulgence, the ultimate laziness, um, fulfilling every craving. And this seems to be the common end of the spectrum that people are gunning for <laughs> in modern society. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the kukuravataka. <laughs> we have someone like the dog duty ascetic, or in this particular sutta, his friend comes with him to speak to the Buddha and his friend is an ox duty ascetic. <laughs> um, these are both extremes on the, the other end, but they're not the most extreme. The most extreme would be self-mortification self-harm, to starve oneself, to injure one's own body, to torture oneself mentally. Um, this is the extreme. And the most extreme uh, of that extreme is where one takes this practice to an inevitable conclusion of um, a sort of suicide and these these extreme very extreme practices are still relatively common today they still exist so certainly i think we've all seen in any number of religions uh, self-mortification by lay people uh, so there'll be a march in the streets and people will be self-flagellating whipping themselves, hanging their body from a hook off a crane or some crazy thing. Um, and in a few religions, there exist practices of suicide by self-starvation. And this is actually, uh, this is, a real ethical debate, um, at least it has been in India, there is a particular Jain practice of self-starvation um, where it is said the, the best possible outcome uh, is to starve oneself to death. And people do this. And the government... <laughs> has had a real tension between religious freedom, expression of religious freedom, and the laws against suicide. And this is supposedly the extreme the Buddha, prior to becoming a Buddha, um, took himself to. So within his life, he 
indulged in these self-mortification practices, starving himself so that he was just skin and bones, etc., etc. And um, I found that there was no value in them. It's interesting to think about the way that we frame these ideas because there is a real temptation I think it's a common temptation to create these dichotomies where we see the two sides as being equivalent oh this is the light side and this is the dark side this is the good stuff and this is the evil stuff and they're symmetrical but that's not really how this works. Um, and even in the suttas, in the Pali Canon, the description given is that on the light side, this is common behavior. This is base behavior <laughs> for multiple definitions of base, um, that this was kind of pathetic to search for indulgence, to search for pleasure constantly, um, to just indulge craving over and over again. And the other side, the darker side, the self-mortification side, this is not described as common. This is described as fruitless, valueless. It, it's not worth doing, but at least if you're in that category, uh, <laughs> you're trying harder than simply indulging your base instincts. Um, and it makes sense. I mean self-mortification, starving oneself, all of these practices are work. Uh, a normal person, um, at least I feel this way, is, is constantly trying to grapple <laughs> with our cravings, whether that's coffee or chocolate or candy or fat, fatty foods or um, the craving to see something, the craving to travel, the craving to um, feel something special, um, whatever the craving is, we are always battling with that. And so the people who self-mortify are also battling with these same things. Um, but they're, they're taking a different tack um, and certainly not a common one. But the idea that modern society holds is that this world of craving and self-indulgence and hedonism um, it is that you can have it, but you, you just need to temper it little so you know don't drink so much that you're a total alcoholic you can have a drink here and there don't eat so much candy and so much fatty food that you grow to become uh, morbidly obese um, but you can have a bit here and there and uh, you know within reason and it becomes this conversation about what is the middle? What is moderation? Um, and in that light, often the practices, the ideas espoused by Gautam Buddha, um, the ideas which are presented in say, of a Vipassana meditation course. 
are seen as quite extreme. They're, so they're seen as the kind of self mortification side of the equation. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, no phone for 10 days. No books for 10 days, no TV for 10 days. How will I survive? Um, and it's a little easier to see how an individual, a grown man 2,500 years ago, may have found his way into something as ridiculous as a dog duty ascetic practice this man had no phone he had no tv he had no books um there was certainly writing uh, in 500 600 bc but um not for the common people uh, the printing press didn't exist and um, books were quite expensive so the idea that you could indulge in these sorts of things um, was not there and so what you might indulge in would be uh, games um, you might indulge in alcohol you might indulge in food if you could afford it but the indulgences were, were not so readily available and not so extreme as they are in our modern day society. So um, it, it's reasonable to expect that in 500 or 600 BCE that the idea of the middle path is really um, what you would experience on a Vipassana course. So you wake up before the sun and you eat two solid meals. You sleep enough. Um, you can take a nap if you need to. <laughs> um, you get some time to walk around outside. There's, um, all your needs are met, um, and then some. But there's no real indulgence there. And this idea, the idea of behaviorally the middle path, um, the actions of the middle path, it's a little difficult for us today. Uh, when I describe going on a Vipassana course to friends who've not tried it yet, um, they're mortified. <laughs> they're mortified of being away from their hobbies, away from their family, away from their friends, away from the city, away from entertainment, movies, TV, books, phones, computers, the internet everything for 10 days um, and, and I, th I think that that's probably um, uh, that's probably a little illuminating um, or at least I hope it is I think that there are other activities that have nothing to do with meditation which can take a person a bit closer to the absence of these extremes. Um, camping eh, or trekking um, is the, the most accessible I can think of. And generally, the idea is to get away from society, um, to take a little break, to have a fast from the internet and your phone and all of these sorts of things. You may take a book with you, but you're not soaking <laughs> in humanity um, hour after hour, day after day. And 
um, the sorts of people who find being in nature, being away from the city, being away from large populations for a period of time, not forever, um, who, who find those kinds of environments comforting, healthy, um, they may also find uh, value in meditation. But meditation sort of, it makes use of an environment like that for the sake of providing a foundation for the meditation itself. You can't, well, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, you can't meditate on a Bombay local train, but I know people who do. <laughs> but you can't learn meditation on a Bombay local train. Um, you can barely learn it at home. I mean, our homes are full of all sorts of disturbances, natural, normal disturbances. I mean, someone comes and rings the doorbell, the phone rings, it's, the dishes need to be done, the floors need to be vacuumed, the car needs to be filled with gas. This regular, normal, everyday things are huge interruptions um, when it comes to learning meditation. So it may have been easier, at least a little bit, um, 2,500 years ago to identify what is a middle path action-wise, environment-wise. Um, but we still have access to these things today. Tomorrow I will talk briefly about the different kinds of action and um, then we will discuss the actual content of the, the dog duty ascetic sutta. I hope everyone is taking good care of themselves. I hope everyone is taking good care of everyone around them. And I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.